Hello, this is Nick of Time. Welcome to our 11th talk about time. We've been spending a fair amount of time on special relativity's construct of time, um, and specifically time dilation. And we've been looking at it in the past several lectures in the context of the twin paradox. Let me review. What we've shown in the past several lectures, not including the last lecture, is that special relativity's time dilation cannot cause the NPTD, the net proper time difference that occurs or is alleged to occur in the twin paradox scenario, Einstein's twin paradox claim of 1905. Well, first let me be sure we all understand the NPTD. Uh, we'll start off by reviewing proper time. Proper time is the amount of time recorded on a clock between two events where the clock is present at both events. So, um, for the twin paradox, scenario we have event one is the start of the round trip and event two is the end of the round trip and both twins are present for both of those events so the net proper time difference is the difference between how much time is recorded by those two clocks the so-called stay-at-home clock and the traveling clock so let's say that the stay-at-home clock recorded four hours between start and end of the round trip, and the traveling clock recorded two hours between the start and end of the round trip. So the net difference of the proper times is four hours, the amount recorded on the stay-at-home twins clock and two hours for the traveling clock leaving a net proper time difference of two hours so pretty simple just the difference between how much time is recorded on the clocks they, they need to really be together at least in special relativity to compare clock clock time Let me make a side point here. Um, relativists and talking about the twin paradox often talk about the stationary twin and the stationary frame and the traveling twin. Um, but that's really misleading terminology because out in deep space, for example, and you have two twins traveling at a relative velocity, Certainly within special relativity, you have no criterion for saying which one is stationary and which one is traveling or which one is traveling faster than the other. Preferred improvement would be to say the non-accelerating uh, twin and the accelerating twin. But the term stationary twin sort of simulates a single preferred frame and a traveling twin as he's traveling with respect to that so-called stationary twin traveling with respect to uh, a single preferred frame so the terminology used by the relativist is kind of simulating uh, the preferred frame technology and tends to uh, make one think, simulate uh, that kind of preferred frame model, and that's why it can make sense, or seem to make sense. Anyway, in the last few talks, we've shown the first bullet, interpreting special relativity time dilation as describing physical effects, for example, uh, change in the rate of proper time accumulation 
is invalidated deeply invalidated we have three separate levels of logic problems that lead to contradictions and at each one of those levels there are multiple problems that show there are problems with the relativistic logic at least for this interpretation of time dilation well uh, quite a few relativists have seen the problem with claiming that time dilation causes a different clock uh, rate, a different proper time accumulation rate. So they've advocated other causes for the net proper time difference. But this shows that those relativists agree with our prior point. They've rejected time dilation as cause of the net proper time dilation and gone on and trying to uh, develop, look at, analyze, propose another cause for the net proper time difference. So in a way uh, looking at these other arguments is kind of irrelevant to our main point but per the third bullet we will take a look at that, but we'll briefly discuss them for the side topic of looking at special relativity and critical thinking, or lack of critical thinking. And if we see a lot of examples of lack of critical thinking, then we can uh, think, well, maybe there are problems here. Maybe this hasn't really been analyzed well enough. Okay, another category of reconciliation argument is the use of observed time in the argument rather than proper time. But since the paradox and the twin paradox itself is about proper time, then basing an argument on something other than proper time really doesn't make sense. So even before one starts, we can see this approach is flawed. And again, like the turn around acceleration category that we talked about last time, the fact that relativists are looking at this approach implies that they've rejected time dilation as uh, causing the net proper time difference as affecting a rejected time dilation is affecting uh, proper time accumulation rates for clocks. So it again confirms our main point that time dilation cannot cause physical effects. Not does not describe proper time. Okay, we'll take a specific example of this category and take a hard look at it using critical thinking. Uh, some relativists have proposed explaining the net proper time difference in terms of relative simultaneity. A construct that we've discussed as having dubious value. Anyways, but. Okay. Here's the example. The claim is that the change in what the traveling twin views is simultaneous when he goes from the outbound frame to the inbound frame is used to calculate the net proper time difference. Well, lo and behold, this calculation gives the right numerical answer, but it's not valid physics. As this argument, this model, does not affect accumulated proper time at all. If one changes 
one's clock readings manually when one goes from the outbound frame to the inbound frame then this indeed would change clock readings but that is not part of the twin paradox and it's not um, really affecting proper time proper time is what the clock itself accumulates and does not include manual resetting of the clocks and just another point you know simultaneity uh, is really a man-made construct and Einstein made uh, his relative simultaneity construct based on some uh, dubious uh, assumptions so to say that the physical effect is going to be changed automatically when you change frames just doesn't make sense. So a picture always helps to keep these things in mind. Here we have a clock that's showing two o'clock and there's no human hands shown here but we see the clock sort of automatically resetting itself to one o'clock, something that's not been observed um, no matter how much acceleration is going on. So if someone is applying critical thinking, I mean there are no guarantees that critical thinking will always lead you to the right example or right uh, conclusion uh, but as we saw in the 1800s we had a lot of people doing critical thinking and sort of step by step uh, some people getting things right some people getting things half right and other people challenging the part that's half wrong and making making progress throughout the 1800s but I think you can apply critical thinking sometimes if if I just just stick out like a sore thumb and just don't make sense uh, for example so this <laughs> wanted Edwards wanted somebody to go back and tie with me you get paid after we get back must bring your own weapons safety not guaranteed I've only done this once before hopefully you wouldn't tend to accept this uh, just out of hand and uh, contact the person and immediately want to go back in time uh, at the very least I think you'd have a few questions to ask the person if not dismissing it out of hand one needs to exercise critical thinking and learn that style of thinking as Aristotle said it's the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought such as a clock going back backwards spontaneously we understand what the other person is saying but we're skeptical about it we don't automatically accept it even if it's our professor is saying it we might we might accept it uh, when we're doing the exam but basically we're not uh, really accepting that idea so once again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're talking in, in this talk mostly about examining critical thinking and looking to some of these reconciliation arguments really seem to make sense or do they just sort of fall apart on their own. So I hope that you can uh, make it back for our next talk. This has been our 11th talk. Hope to see you next time.